Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. We have finally come to the end of Nintendo Power's third year with Nintendo Power number 24 for May of 1991. This issue, we've got the results of the Nintendo Power Awards for 1990. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. The cover game for this issue is Vice Project Doom. The cover is a mix of game art and painted art that meshes together fairly well. In the letters column this issue, the editors are highlighting Mega Man 3 specific fan letters. Ooh, we now get to our cover game, Vice Project Doom, and they've got light purple text on a blue background. That's a really bad layout decision. The article, the parts of it that are readable, gives information on the game's interface and power-ups, as well as some screen grabs from the game's Ninja Gaiden-esque cutscenes, along with maps and boss strategies through stages 1 through 9. That's most of the game. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Vice Project Doom is as good as Ninja Gaiden. Vice Project Doom doesn't have enemies that respawn when you backtrack or move backwards for any reason, so you can manage your jumps better, and it has unlimited continues, which is something that really all NES games should have. You are playing this at home. You're not playing this on an arcade cabinet where you're feeding in quarters. You own the game. You should be able to effectively put it on free play. However, Ninja Gaiden has a wider variety of power-ups, more traversal-based abilities, and better staged cutscenes. The jumps in Ninja Gaiden also feel a little better, but that might be related to the game an animation for jumps, as the protagonist of Vice Project Doom doesn't do the same sort of flippy jump that Ryu, that Ryu Hayabusa does in the Ninja Gaiden games. Both games are also aiming for that sort of tough but fair level of difficulty, but I'd say that in the uh, ultimately, Ninja Gaiden stumbles when pulling off the fair part and just ends up being tough in a kind of brutal, cheaty fashion, whereas Vice Project Doom succeeds at this goal quite admirably. This issue's Howard and Net Net Renister strip has the two playing Monopoly, and the tip really isn't helpful. Basically, it's that if you wait three turns, or wait long enough, you can get out of prison early, or you can trade for a get-out-of-jail-free card, which is probably something that's covered in the game's manual, and is certainly covered in the rules for the board game. This isn't like some obscure house rule thing, or just a house rule thing like, oh, income tax money goes on free parking, and if you land on free parking, you collect it, or anything like that. So, this is probably the least helpful Howard and Nestor thus far, Instead of giving a hint about something that is not necessarily intuitive, or you have to experiment to find, you're giving a hint about something that's in the manual, something that most people would know pretty much out of the gate. We have a movie-licensed game, this issue, with The Rocketeer, based on the upcoming Disney live-action film, based off the graphic novel. The article has maps of all six levels of the game, along with tips for three of the game's four boss fights. So remember how I mentioned just a minute or so ago how Vice Project Doom nailed Tough But Fair because of how the developers managed the difficulty and didn't include cheap tricks like unlimited enemies? Yeah, the Rocketeer doesn't do that. The game has rooms with endlessly rapidly responding enemies along with enemies that respawn when their scroll point, spawn point scrolls off camera. The sprites are also incred incredibly tiny coming to about three quarters to one half of the height of Mario and Super Mario Brothers. Additionally, while the game gives you unlimited continues, it also gives you only one life. Frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if this game isn't adapted from some half-assed version for the ZX Spectrum. This game is, frankly, terrible. And it should be avoided, and actually I'm surprised this wasn't developed um, published by LJN, um, due to the very shovelware feel this game has. There is a SNES version, which we'll get to later, and I really hope that version is better. But now, we come to the Nintendo Power Awards for 1990. The votes have finally been tabulated. It's time to get the results. 
for best graphics and sound and best hero, we have Mega Man 3. I'm fine with this. I mean, Mega Man, 3, Mega Man 3 was my pick for best hero. The Blue Bomber is one of my favorite video game characters. And, well, honestly, while the graphics on Mega Man 3 aren't quite as detailed as the graphics in Castlevania, which was my pick, there's a sense of character and vibrancy suit to them that I can go with. And I, I can totally get people going picking this game. Because each world had, has a different sort of character, different flair to it based on its robot master, and with different music for each world. Um, so, got that going for it, and Super Mario Brothers does do the different graphical style for each world thing, Mario 3. It does also reuse a bit more music as well. So, all things considered, while Mega Man 3 wasn't my pick, I'm okay with this. Castlevania 3 does get a win in Best Challenge, which is, again, perfectly fair and reasonable. To continue with the utter lack of controversy, Super Mario Bros. 3 took Best Play Control, Best Theme and Fun, and Best NES Game, and once again, I can't argue with any of those. Um, Mega Man 3's controls are more precise and more sharp in their movement because of the tight jumps that are required for some of the game's jumping puzzles. Um, but... Again, Mario 3 is an absolutely solid game. It's one of the it's the best title of the series to date. Um, in certain aspects, I'd almost be willing to argue that Super Mario World is almost a step back in terms of the removal of gameplay innovations, like a bit like being able to stockpile multiple power ups, and that sort of thing. Um, so, but still, Mario 3 is. A, utterly solid game, and I see no complaints here. But we do have some controversy, though. Shredder takes best villain, <clears throat> and TMNT2 takes best multiplayer. Now, I'm not surprised by this, as 1990 was entering the peak of Turtle Mania, but, frankly, Gauntlet 2 is really the better multiplayer game. As, for me, when thinking about these categories, Best Multiplayer is a game where, with multiplayer, it is better than it is single player. Not because single player is bad, but because gameplay wise, you get more out of it by playing with more people. Turtles 2, be particularly because of the rebalancing things they do if you're playing with multi playing multiplayer, is about equal single player and multiplayer. Um. And so it doesn't quite fit there. Additionally, Fall of the Foot Clan takes best Game Boy game. Frankly, Fall of the Foot Clan is a very clunky title. It's a game which has a problem that lots of early Game Boy titles have of we want to have big detailed sprites um, because that's what people expect for NES games. But because of that, the camera angle is very tight and constrained and you can't really get a big picture of what's going on and what's coming. Frankly, I would definitely put Final Fantasy Legend over Fall of the Foot Clan. As while certainly Final Fantasy Legend has some clunky game mechanics, mechanics it is far more playable and replayable than Fall of the Foot Clan is in the Game Boy. Shadowgate also took Most Innovative, which is definitely not my pick. The game is a PC or rather Mac port. It's not terrible, but Miracle piano teaching system is very unique as a title, as a console release, as there's nothing like that in terms of a piece of console software or game that is meant to teach you how to play a musical instrument until Rock Band 3 came out with Pro Mode and Rocksmith came out with its compatibility with basically any electric, any and every electric guitar out there. So, that's pretty much my thoughts on the whole thing. Moving on, we have a comic hyping Battle Toads by telling the backstory of the Toads, though to my knowledge this backstory is never used in any future games in the series, so this is just kind of a thing that exists. Short version, 
the Battletoads are actually players in a virtual reality game thing who get sucked into the game by the game's villain, the Dark Queen, and have to play through the game as their virtual avatars. Okay. In classified information, we get a unlimited continue code for Swordmaster and a secret on how to get the most energy tanks in Mega Man 3. Next up is a game called The Lone Ranger by Konami, based off the radio play series and pulp novel series and television series and just massive multimedia franchise. The timing of this is really odd, as the last appearance of the character on film or on television was in the 80s with either the 1981 box office bomb or the 1980 Filmation animated TV series, which lasted a couple years, but ultimately, the Lone Ranger in a franchise, as a franchise had basically died by the time this game had come out. The game, rather than having an overarching plot, appears to be more episodic. The article gives imp detailed information on stages 1 through 5 and shorter notes on 6 through 8. The Lone Ranger is a really odd duck of a game. It's like a mix of Golgo 13 and Crystallis. As the Lone Ranger, you travel through the West fighting evil and getting money from the enemies you defeat, which you can use to buy power-ups like new guns, as well as additional ammunition, like regular bullets and the more damaging silver bullets, and dynamite. However, the game also features run-and-gun action sequences, though ones with more platforming than the Golgo 13 games have, and dungeon exploration sequences, which are depicted in the first person, as with GoGo 13. As with GoGo 13, when you make as you make your way through the dungeons, enemies will burst out. The player will have to fight. What makes it different is if you have your if you have the zapper hooked up to your console and you're playing on a television that supports the zapper, you can shoot your enemies with a light gun, as opposed to having to scroll a set of crosshairs across the screen, which will sound familiar if you've played Golgo 13. Honestly, I'd say the light gun is the best way to handle this, and when I played this game on a emulator for review, both recently and a while back, I used the mouse to re replicate the light gun. It made a really big difference. Um, as it is, the game is fun and controls well, but the fact that it needs a light gun to get the most out of it is a point against it. Moving into the Game Boy games, we have Mysterium, which appears to be a combined wizardry-style dungeon crawler with some item combination and puzzle elements. The article has maps for the first four levels of the game, as well as some crafting notes. Well, Mysterium is less of a dungeon crawler than really a proto-first-person shooter with some puzzle elements. There's no leveling up in this game, though you do have to manage resources like keys and the occasional health power-ups just like in Doom and Wolfenstein. And as far as a proto-FPS games go, though, well, it's not a terrible game, but it's nowhere near as polished and easy to play as Doom. There isn't a sense of character in terms of the environment, the enemies you're fighting, that we got from Doom, or for that matter, Wolfenstein 3D. I said, if you're looking to chart the evolution of the first-person shooter, this is definitely a game worth picking up, but otherwise you can really give this game a miss. Next is Gauntlet 2, which has now gotten a Game Boy port, making it portable and without multi-tap support. We have maps for the first five stages and some general survival notes. Well, guess what? It's, it's more Gauntlet, just without color, or the ability to do four-player co-op, which were the big strong points for Gauntlet 2 in the first place. Also, it's a smaller the screen, and you also have some, some additional flicker problems, so... Actually, skip this in favor of the NES version, or the Genesis version, or really any version other than this. Next is Battle Unit Zeoth, which is another shooter, which has you pounding a mecha, one which appears to be not con connected to any existing IP. One of the problems shoot 'em ups have on the Game Boy is the problem of perspective. If you make the sprites small enough, you have plenty of room to move around the game's levels and see what's happening around your ship and plan advanced movement. You lose the sense of character you get with detailed sprites. 
but if you make the sprites too large, you have no room to maneuver. Battle you Zeoth attempts to get around this by using really large sprites and even larger level maps that go off your screen, meaning that you have chunks of various levels off screen so you can't see what's going on out there. Now, if the game gave you some sort of mini-map or radar to tell you where enemies were in relation to you, this would be a problem. But it doesn't really give you that, not in the way that you need. So you can't maneuver properly through the level to take out the most enemies, score the most points, and pick up the necessary power-ups to prepare yourself for the level boss, as effectively as you could in this game were, say, yes, and had more screen real estate. Now, this game had a Famicom or a Super Famicom version that this is a port from, I'd, I'd recommend that. But this game has neither, so unfortunately, all I can really do is recommend you give this game a miss. Next is Nintendo World Cup, and well, if you liked Nintendo World Cup before, here's a portable version! We're going to be seeing a lot more of these. As it is, this game plays a lot like Nintendo World Cup, with the difference that the game screen is smaller than the original port, which means there's a lot more scrolling involved. To try and compensate for this, the game focuses the screen on the ball and places a map of the port on the subscreen with your character highlighted. The problem is it doesn't highlight the location of the ball, which makes it tricky to figure out where you are in relation to the ball. Ultimately, and this is the same problem with um, Gauntlet 2, you're really better off playing the NES version of this game. That version has multi-tap support, and it also handles the game perspective better than this version does. Next is Spot, which looks like a 7-Up branded version of Othello. Because this is, in fact, a version of Othello that features 7-Up's Spot mascot. It's a competently made Othello game, more versy if you're going for the non-trademarked version. Um, but there's a version of this game for the NES they prefer over this version, as it supports couch mu multiplayer out of the gate, whereas this version doesn't support multiplayer, multi-tap, or otherwise. Or Game Boy Connect Link Cable, or otherwise. Next is Chess Master, which is getting a Game Boy version, in addition to having its PC version. Now, I love chess, I love chess games, and I will admit that I was in the chess club in high school. Yes, the nerdy guy talking about video games on the internet was in Chess Club. Who knew? When I wasn't able to find someone to play chess with, my fallback was the Chess Master series of games, and I consider that franchise to be the gold standard for home computer chess. It's a game series that has a wide selection of difficulty settings that would make the game approachable for players of all skill levels, and which could make you better at chess. The Game Boy version of Chess Master controls fairly well, and has some options to adjust the difficulty, though generally it's a one-size-fits-all game, in the sense of one difficulty setting, and you kind of stuck with it. Um, now, the game does have options to let you save your game, so if you get stuck in a long game and have to turn your system off, you do have a way to do so and not lose your place, which are big points in, your, in the game's favor. Next, in the Game Boy Classified Information column, we unfortunately have a whole slew of reruns here, so not much more to not much to talk about this time. Going briefly back to the NES titles, we have Adventures of Lolo 3, which is the latest game of the Lolo series, and it looks a lot more colorful and lively than the first two games. The article gives maps with selections of screens from the first 17 worlds. Adventures of Lolo 3 is the game that Adventures of Lolo should have been. From the screenshots and coverage of Lolo 2, that game was basically another set of levels with pretty much identical graphics. It's like a expansion pack, standalone expansion. Lolo 3 prevents, presents a more colorful or vibrant world than the first two games. Additionally, the game provides more freedom in picking the order that you take, the ch take on the challenges in, leading to a game that really fits for people who are experienced with puzzle games or just kind of new to the whole genre and are just getting their feet wet. The game even has a really good tutorial world where if you're unfamiliar with the franchise or haven't played a Lolo game in a while, you can kind of get the hang of how Lolo's puzzles are structured and then from there just take on the, the worlds in pretty much any order so, if you want to go straight to the hard stuff, you can go straight to the hard stuff. In the top 30 column, Ultima 4, Quest of the Avatar, is entering the top 10, and DuckTales is returning to the list. 
In the Celebrity Profile column, we have a look at Alex Winter, co-star of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and Bogus Journey. Well, aside from the perpetually in development Bill and Ted film, probably the most recent thing Alex Winter is notable for doing is he directed a documentary on Napster, which I've heard incredibly good things about. And I really need to get around to checking out. In Counselor's Corner, we have a bunch more questions about Star Tropics and even more questions about Ultima, Ultima 4, particularly ways to get cash and attribute points without messing with your virtues. Among the Ulcerans in the Now Playing Calm this issue is the very problematic Wampum from Jalico. This is one of those de-Japanified games I was discussing last issue. And in this case, this game was a reskin of Sayuki World 2, the game focused on Journey to the West, and in particular, the Monkey King. But instead of using Journey to the West and the Monkey King, we've reskinned the game to use a stereotypical Native American character with no real Native American or tribal identity or anything. It's just generic Native American guy as opposed to comparable to having a character who's a generic African tribal guy or what have you. And so... We get the weird situation of a game based around a racist stereotype of Native Americans done by a publisher to make the game who more appealing to people who won't buy it because the main character would be considered too Asian. Seriously, by this point, we've gotten several games in arcades based directly on the character of the Monkey King from Journey to the West. Games like Sun Sun from Capcom. If you just made the game about the Monkey King, you would have been fine. You would have been fine. Worst case, what would have really happened is people who didn't know who the Monkey King was would have thought it was a character you made up. All things considered, that's a better solution than making your game about a racial stereotype. Because in that situation, you PO'd nobody. You PO'd no one. There is no controversy about your game. But you still have a fun platformer. It's fine. On a lighter note, continuing with the now playing column, Nobunaga's Ambition 3 and The Bard's Tale have gotten NES releases. It's the original Bard's Tale, which is a wizardry-style dungeon crawler, as opposed to the more modern Bard's Tale, which is the Diablo hack and style hack and slasher, with Carrie Elways being snarky. In the Pack Watch column, Tecmo Super Bowl is coming to the NES. Finally, we wrap up this issue with a look at two of the upcoming titles for the now renamed SNES. Or SNES, whatever you want to call it. It's not the Super Famicom in the U.S. anymore. So we are type and a hole in one golf. My picks for this issue are Adventures of Lolo 3 for the NES and Chess Master for the Game Boy. Lolo 3 does a really good job of giving the series a sense of character and charm that to a certain extent it kind of lacked with earlier installments. And the semi nonlinear approach to the game also is really great as well. And as for Chess Master on the Game Boy, you have you have a portable chess game, which is really good and challenging, and with, which has multiplayer that lets you play against other people on the go as well, putting it up on any of the LCD games at, at the time as far as chess is concerned. And it's still a fun, fairly challenging chess game now, unless you're, like, really, really good at chess. So, I definitely recommend picking those up. Although, that said, as far as chess match for the Game Boy goes... If you're looking for something not to play on the go, to play on your console at home with your, or on your PC or whatever, get one of the more main Chess Master games. Or for that matter, Chess Master is currently available for the Xbox 360. There's probably going to be a port, if there isn't a port for Xbox One or PlayStation, uh, oh, not yet. There's a port for Xbox One now, there will be one soon, probably. There's pure chess for the Vita and the PlayStation 4, so there are more recent games if you have actual physical consoles you can go with instead of the Game Boy version, but if you're looking for something for the Game Boy, 
take with you on the go, that's a good version to go with. In any case, next time I'm starting to take a look at the best of the rest for 1990, as I'm starting to take a look at the titles for the Game Boy that made their top 10 rankings, but didn't get covered in the magazine proper. Now, because I'm in the middle of some school stuff with my senior project and that sort of thing, I'm going to slow down my releases on this. Or not so much slow down my releases, but slow down the rate. I'll be going one game at a time for each episode. This way, well, I can focus more on each game, and because they're the best of the rest, they're not featured in the magazine itself, I don't have to focus on the larger context of the game in how the art how it's covered in the magazine article, what's covered about it in its magazine article, and that sort of thing. So, that'll be next time. Until then, if you enjoy the show, please contribute to my Patreon. The link is in the show notes, and the URL is in the credits. Supporting the show's Patreon will help me improve the quality of the show, and in the long run will help me get the show up more regularly. Additionally, please like the video if you enjoy it, and subscribe if you'd like to know when the next video comes out. Also, of course, feel free to post in the comments below, or share it with your friends on the Reddits, or the Tumblrs, or whatever other video networks that you and social networks that you use. So, thank you very much for watching. See you next time.